we'll start this session. Just one second. Um, okay. All right. Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for making our time. And this is just to formally welcome every one of us to our August edition. August is a very special edition for two key reasons, which I'm going to um, talk about in a bit. Um, you're, you're, you're welcome. This is a platform where we use the concept of storytelling to learn about real life issues, where we share our thoughts, our strengths, our vulnerabilities, our challenges, as we make the learning re real here so everyone can relate to you because research has shown that one of the best ways to learn is through storytelling. And this is, this is our fifth edition. Um, I always say that we are first humans before we became professionals. And for us to, to ensure that we are at our best as professionals, then that's element, that human element of us that we need to pay a lot of attention to. So today's edition is a very special edition. We have um, two critical activities today. The first is the fact that today's edition is happening on, on, in the month where we are celebrating our 60th independence as a country. And on that note, it's important that we recognize Nigeria. Um, and afterwards then, the second reason why this edition is also special is because given the current situation that we are in with regards to the protest by our youth around Nigeria reformation, national reformation, it's also critical that our discussions also speak to, to, to that. So on that note, I'll play a one minute jingle just to welcome everyone officially to my HR Storybook series. Just one sec. Thank you so much. On that note, the second activity we have today is we need to listen to our national anthem. It's our independence celebration month. And as faithful Nigerians, on that note, I'll turn over to Dan Milari to take us through the national anthem. Thank you. I'm Larry, can we have the national attention? Thank you very much, Damilari. I also think it's also important at this time to observe a one minute silence for our youth, um, the, the couple of people that have lost their life recently um, to SAS brutality, police brutality. Um, they are part of us. And on that note, I'd like us to observe a one minute silence for our youth. They are our heroes. Thank you.
May their souls continue to rest in perfect peace. Amen. All right, so it's time to sort of okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So joining us this afternoon, we have a very proud Nigerian youth who will be lending our voice at this time to contribute to our nation building and youth development. I mean, she's, she's someone that I personally admire. I met um, Ife about two, three years ago. I remember the first conversation that I had, very intelligent, very smart. And um, she, she, she's so passionate when it comes to human capital development. Um, I'm gonna read her profile out very briefly. So Ife is a grounded professional in strategic people development, workplace design, workplace experience design, Management consultant and of course HR consulting. You're breaking up with my with me. Pardon? I can't hear you properly. Oh, you can can you hear me now? Oops. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um if you have the who's our guest speaker, she's someone who is very passionate about human development. I mean, she's, she's led many successful professional support programs and initiatives to young and experienced talent and, and, and businesses across um, Africa. Uh, she's the founder of HR in Tech, an initiative that brings together HR professionals practicing in the tech and innovation space and their career banters to EFRD. Um, it, uh, it's a CSR initi initiative where she helps young professionals that like their career goals and professional development. She's an international speaker, a seasoned career coach. Um, she holds degree in HRCI Global Professional, uh, GPHR. She's a member of SPHR um, and of course CIPM as well. She recently received um, Oh, she has recently received both local and global recognition for her work in supporting young talent and organization through professional development and was recently awarded one of the top 150 global HR influencer and a top 50 career influencer in, in Africa. Um, she, she's here today to share her story, her experience and views on her journey to success. I mean, because we are at a point in Nigeria where our youth are creating their own story. You know, so our, our youth have looked at our history as a nation, and from our history, they are defining their own story. I mean, so our history in the last 60 years, it, there's, there, there hasn't been a lot of wins for us. And they are here to change the narrative. Now they are here to make a demand for what they want. We are here to say, to support our youth that together, we want end to SAS, end to police brutality. We cannot have people who were hired to protect our nation. Yes, we can't have them killing our future, killing our human capital. No, today we are gonna to talk about what we need to do, right? And, and as professionals, how can we begin to lend our voice to, to national development? You know, there's a lot going on. I remember two years ago, one of my husband's um, nephew, went to work, he, he, he works in the innovation um, industry and um, he runs shifts. So one morning after running his night shift at about eight o'clock on his way home, just at the Keja along, I mean, the SAS vehicle came and they packed people from bus stop. You know, we didn't find him for two days. Unknown to us that the SAS people had taken people randomly. This someone just young guy, just coming from, from work. You know, and he was there for two days until he eventually got someone to call us and all of that. It was two days of emotional, emotional unrest. We we're all worried as a family. Eventually, we went to bail him. Though they, they said bail is free, but we paid. You know, he was lucky because he got out of that scene. I don't want to talk about what he went through, but it was horrible. But some people have lost their lives already, and we can no longer keep quiet about this. So today, we want to talk as professionals. It would be nice to hear from 
if you are the who is someone who is leading a lot of youth, I mean the Gen Zs and the millennials are in our workforce, and they are the ones who are largely impacted by you know the brutality that we experience from our security system. Um, so if you are the Thank you so much, first and foremost, for accepting to join us this afternoon. It's a really emotional one for me. And um, I would like to hear from you. What, what were the challenges that you had to face, you know, building your career from, from, from the onset? Because right now, the, 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 the way of working has changed. In, we no longer need young people to be in a particular place to work. Now it's work on the go. They go, go with their laptop and their gadgets. And this, this, is, this is their work instrument. And this is what is being used, right? A part of what is being used to, to molest and harass them, given the fact that, you know, they also have all the, the looks and all of that. And also given the fact in addition to that, that we have a very creative generation i mean these are the guys who are innovative and creative they they turn things around they look at you and they turn your look around they they, they change so many things that's highly creative i have a 12 years old daughter at home if i think i've done something i just need to call her she brings different perspective and different eyes to things that I've done. Say, mommy, why don't you do it this way? Why don't you just change this? And everything just comes out looking more beautiful. And that's the generation that we have. But they are being misconstrued. You know, they are being mis misrepresented. And by, they are being misjudged by their strengths, which is in the space of innovation and creativity. If I'd like to start uh, from you, let's hear your story. Yeah. While you were growing up, you know, from being a young HR professional to where you are today, were there challenges that you experienced? You know, let's, it would be nice to hear from you. Over to you, and thanks so much once again. Thank you very much, um, Krishna. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I mean, it's also quite uh, touching, emotional, and, you know, what we're going through as a nation, and, you know, the fact that the youth are raising their voices, and we're having challenges to be heard, to be spoken to, you know, for the challenges to be addressed. So, um, so if, if Harry, can you please speak up? I mean, you're standing a bit distant, though. Okay. Very distant. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, so it's, it, it, Pretty much a challenging time to be here. Can you hear me better now? Yes, it is better. Thank you. It's pretty much a challenging time, um, but I'm happy that we are here, and I'm glad that you know, as people who lead other people, we are looking at these issues and we are all getting involved. To be honest, I encourage everybody. We need to get involved in what's going on in Nigeria. Now, if I look back at my career story. Maybe it could have been different, or maybe, you know, things happen for a purpose, but it all boils down to the fact that we have a country that works the way it works. So sometimes you're out of school, you have plans for yourself, things just don't go, you know, the way you, you plan it. So it's so rough and so tough out there. I mean, I always tell people that people like me, I never, you know, really, I never had it on a platform of gold. Like, I had to walk through everything, I had to struggle through everything to get to get everything. So I, I just, and I didn't have like anybody, I didn't have a godfather, a godmother, I, I didn't have anybody anywhere that I could say, oh, do this for me, do that for me. But as I went through, um, I learned. So the key thing for me was starting out my career, I always wanted my, you know, start my career in HR. For some reason, I think pretty much, uh, maybe because, you know, I grew up with parents who were teachers and counselors, so I wanted to be in HR, I wanted to support people, help people, and that was how, you know, that dream of um, working in this house in about. And when I came out, I tried to actualize that dream, but I found myself in a team where I wasn't growing, nothing was happening. I was, you know, I, I didn't like the kind of practice, which I practice that I was doing on there. So for some reason, I, I sort of preferred to step away, um, just go do something else. And, you know, just take my time to learn the road the right way. So it was quite challenging. And then I decided to move into customer service, and for some reason, adding my food back in which I was, you know, such a big um, struggle. I mean, it was a lot of things that I had to do. But at the end of the year, one thing I can say is that it wasn't a work in the past. And that's why I always tell 
people who are trying to come forward now, you're young, even if you're experienced, you're trying to, whatever it is you're trying to achieve in your career. I, I, don't, I know some of you never had it, you know, you never had it perfect, but, you know, we just kept pushing, just didn't give up, just didn't want to be defined by the Nigerian statistics that, oh, you come out of school, there are no jobs, you have to join this, you have to do that, do that. We didn't want to sit back and just do stuff. So we wanted, I know a number of people who are like that, and I was one of them who just wanted to defy the odds and just, you know, go through the process without giving up. So, yeah. I think the mic is muted. Okay, yes, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I thanks so much for sharing that, Ifyadi. It, it's highly relatable. You know, as, as young um, professionals, you're trying to define all the odds. Um, there are some that are beyond your control, right? So there are some that it's, it, it's, it's brought upon you from the, from the kind of environment that, that you live in. For some, is the fact that you didn't have a particular um, grade while you were in school. You know, there's a lot of discrimination around or oh, your class of degree and all of that. Now, so my question would be, does all those things, do they still matter given the current times that you are in? You know, your class of degree and your course, your educational courses, do they still matter right now? Um, to be honest, to be honest, I'll say yes or no. Um, no, because the the you see the the work the work economy and the job we are moving from a job economy to a skill economy. So it's pretty much about the skills that you have right now. But then again, it's not everybody who is moving with the same with the same um, speed of development or the same speed of advancement, right? There are still organizations who are struggling to come up, to catch up. There are organizations that people don't understand some of these things. If you are your network, we're actually struggling to hear you. Network is sporadic. Oops. Fiadi, we can't hear you. School, a bit, you know, traditional, with the changes in, you know, that's not my network, yeah? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, it's a lot better now. Okay, just give me a second. Okay. It's a lot better, okay, thank you. Hello, can you still hear me? Okay, now we can hear you, but we, we, we lost your uh, last statement for about 20 seconds ago. Okay. Okay, so I think our people have transformed. The, the work itself has changed. Even the workers have changed. But you see, there are a lot of organizations who are still yet to catch up with that change. There are still organizations that are traditional, that do something. And to be quite frank here, yeah, one of the reasons I do what I do is because of how much struggle I had, you know, trying to build a career. Now, you find out at that time, you have organizations who would tell you, you must either have a 2 one or a first class in so, 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 so. And then you're just wondering, and you know, this, this, this trend was mostly by some big organizations, and then even the smaller ones just keep on the trend. But after Somebody is asking recruiter, why do you need a first class or a two on guard? They don't even know. They just see it somewhere. Somebody's walking through my years of, you know, my years in work. I found out that the fact that someone has a first class doesn't necessarily mean that they will be smarter or better at being sure. With what we have now, like I said, the job, the job, the work world has moved from a job economy to a skill economy. It's a matter of what skills you have. I'll give you a typical example of my workplace. I work in the technology industry, so I work pretty much with developers. 
every one of them, as you can imagine, system engineers, IOS developers, Android developers, every one of them, you know, the um, system security professionals, as much as you know, as many of you know, the professionals in technology you can think of. But you know what we're saying, motivation engineers and all of that. But one thing is, we find out that sometimes the people we need might not even have, you know, very, all those kind of degrees that people are looking for. So you're looking at their skills. Yeah, you're looking at their skills. So in my work for that, we have quite a number of people that do not either have a degree or any, maybe, all of those overly embellished forms of education and so that. And therefore, they're still doing well. And I tell you that, you see, one of the challenges we have in terms of talent is not even like local employers. So I sit down and I find my developers getting jobs abroad and being relocated. So those are even the talent, even, you know, the people that, um, so it's a global talent uh, struggle for us, yeah? So, and then, like I said, these are some of these people are people who don't have a degree, don't have any, you know, but it doesn't mean that they're not skilled. It doesn't mean that they don't have what it takes to do certain jobs. And I have even seen some of these guys who didn't have like degrees, who just have technical or practical training on the side. I have seen some of them do way better than those people with even master's degrees and all the rest. So I keep saying this to everyone who says to us, academic intelligence is not a measure of success and real life. That's that's a key thing for me. It's good, no doubt. You can't take it away, but it's not a measure that someone would either do well or not, or maybe like you didn't go to school or you don't have a school one or you have a short class that you'd never succeed. No, mm. I don't. I I I don't like it. Okay, thank you so much, Ifiadi, for sharing that. Um, just to also mention that. Yeah, although you're sounding a bit distant, I'm not sure if you can get your headphones. That might really help the, the so audio maybe sound I, I think I, I probably need to speak on my earphones. That's really interesting. I think yeah. my Okay, please. Okay. So I speak directly from my ear. Okay. So while you're trying to get your headphones, the, a couple of questions have started coming in. And... Um, of course, this speaks to what we are faced as HR professionals at our various organizations. And the whole idea here is to hear and share and learn from one another. I have my first question in. I'm not sure. Can I go on and read out the question to you, if you had it? Okay. Can you hear yes. me better now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. So the, yes, yes. So I have I have my first question from Chema here. It says, the new saying is HR has to be strategic, but how can HR go about being strategic while focusing on staff management? Did you get that question? Sorry, I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. So. I have a question in the chat box here from Chioma that says, the new saying is HR has to be strategic, but how can HR go about being strategic while focusing on staff management? Did you hear that? Hello, Ifiadi, are you with us? I think she's got really, really bad reception. Mm, I think so too, because it doesn't seem like she can hear us. I think maybe if you can charge her to uh, log off and log back on, because I had to do that. Oh, really? Okay. So, Ifiadi, if you are with us, uh, let me just send her a chat. Um, a moment. Maybe I try to switch my network. Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, we'll give you some time to try and switch your network. Um, these days, you can't, you can't just have one network. <laughs> I have like three or four in my house. <laughs> From one network service provider to another. I mean, you can't even vouch for... for 
for their connectivity strength, for a consistent connectivity strength. I've had to, one, one day, one provider is up, and the next day, another provider is down, and you just have to continue to switch over. Ifedi, are you with us now? Oh, oh, I don't think so, because her screen is frozen. I mean, that's the reality that we are in now. Uh oh, okay. So the assumption is she's, she's locked up to re-log in as she switches and um, um, switches her network and re-logs in to join us. Okay, so thanks everyone. Please let's keep the questions coming in, in through. We'll would have our guest speaker share uh, with us. And if anyone wants to um, add any comments or any thoughts around the question, please feel free as well to, to jump in. Don't know what's wrong with my screen. Okay. Yep. I'm not sure if you have the raise hand button. Yes, you can use the raise hand button as well. Um, it's it's really it's it's really been a, a moment of reflection for, for us as HR professionals. Um, and there's been a lot of thoughts and perspectives that have been going on around the current um, protest by, by the youth. And how, how, how can we be very supportive, you know, supportive in, from two angles. I mean, one angle is for them to be able to exercise their um, civic rights. The other angle is also for their health, you know, um, given the fact that they need to also be mindful of COVID-19 protocols. Okay, I think I'm back. Okay. Oh, finally, this is a lot better, Ifedi. Okay. So let me read out Sorry. the first question. <laughs> yes, it's a lot better. Okay, so the first question I, re I read out okay. was from Shema. Uh-oh. If any, can you hear me? Hey. Hey. Freddy, I'm not sure. You, you sound louder though, but uh, your voice is a bit... Uh... Yes, I can. Okay. I can hear you. Right. Okay, great. So I'm reading out the first Hello? question. I can hear you. I'm reading out the first okay. question. Yes. So the first question is from Chema. It reads, the new saying in HR, the new saying is HR has to be strategic. But how can HR go about being strategic while focusing on staff management? Why focusing on what staff management? Absolutely, staff management. I, I mean, I think the person means, you know, what was um, it? The staff, staff, admin, staff management, more like operational staff management, I presume. Yes. Okay, okay. All right, thank you very much for that question, Choma. Yes, so um, everything about HR has to be strategic. So even your operations, whatever operational aspects of you know HR that is being undertaken has to be in line with the strategy. What is strategic? Strategic means that HR is working in tandem with the business, which is what my business wants to achieve. And this is how I intend to help my business to achieve that purpose. Yeah. Now I understand that in smaller businesses sometimes staffing might be an issue. Staffing might be a problem. So you find yourself as a HR person running or administrative and operational things that then the strategy yield more support to the management. But when that becomes you know, the case for, for you or for anybody, one of the things to do is to ask for help so that you can focus your time on more strategic things. Now, again, it also depends on the volume of work that you have. If you can prioritize your work well, manage your team well, then you can actually still do the same because they both go hand in hand. But what we're saying about HR being strategic is that HR shouldn't focus only on those things that are not important or those things that do not have direct impact on the business strategy. What we're saying is that HR is a core member of the organization. HR is a core member of the planning team. HR should be involved in planning the business. HR should be involved in executing those plans. HR should look at the people impact. HR should look at the people impact. HR should be able to advise management accordingly. You don't want to be in an organization where, you know, as a HR person, maybe decisions get, get you know, decisions are made. 
HR is not considered or not you know, factored in, or maybe because people feel that, oh, this HR person is not adding value, or maybe they're not strategic, or they're not very helpful, or they're not the kind of person to bring maybe value to the table. That's what one wants to avoid as a HR professional. So as a HR professional, you must know your audience, you must know your work end to end, and you must understand how your work interfaces with management and with the business, overall business objectives as a whole. So HR acts as a person, as a middle man to the organization and to the employees. So yes, you should be able to have uh, an offshoot of okay. strategic plans that the organization has. So what uh, you know, operation you're having is still tied to the strategic goals of the business. Okay. Thanks, Ifeadi, for sharing that. Shall I have an up? You want to add to that? Yes, let me just quickly take it from, you know, where she stopped Thanks, by giving Shola. practical examples. My name is Shola Dekoya. I work with resource intermediary. Sorry, I can't share my video because... It's fine. It's fine. Okay, I just Thanks. jumped on this meeting last minute. Okay, so the thing with HR strategy is the word is just big for nothing. It's, it's just basically thinking ahead and making sure you don't lose the core. And for every business owner, the core is the bottom line, yeah? And generally, HR has been seen as a co um, cost center. So in as much as, yes, HR is the cost center. Mind you, I'm not in core HR. I work in a human resource consultancy firm, and I've been there for like 13, 14 years, so I understand, and we're all consultants anyways. Okay, so now, everybody sees HR as, you know, cost center. So HR has to strategically align with the business goal and ensure that in as much as, okay, we are doing this, we are making sure employee is engaged and all the other things that, you know, HR does. HR has to contribute to the bottom line. HR has to see themselves as a unit, a business unit, I dare say, because some people will tell you, hey, I'm not, uh, I'm not I don't know how to sell. Oh, yes, you do know how to sell. You just haven't given it a shot. It would be nice to hear that some funds, some income came in. I'm just giving you practical examples. Some income came in from a staff of human resources. It would be good to hear that you're not just collecting and collecting. It would be good to hear that you're putting out plans to save. That's not the fact that everybody's enjoying benefits. You are entering into negotiations that are giving your organization beautiful deals and adding to the bottom line because you know there are two two ways you can save cost you can save cost by adding income or by saving so if you cannot add can you at least save not by reducing people's um you know right. people's benefits but by entering there are several deals you see i always tell people if you don't find you can't see there are several deals out there that people get into and they realize that oh my god you mean i could have gotten this thing anyway so basically that's just don't let me go on so, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're enjoying thank your you, thank you so much Shala. <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, so, Shama, I hope, yeah i hope you picked a couple of learnings from that so basically uh when you talk about staff management how do you link that to your business core we talk about strategy there is an operational and it's part of strategy and HR has some responsibility in that thank you we have another question here from from razak um it reads why did you choose to stay alone not minding seeking mentorship out there since this could have facilitated your growth in HR practice. So that's one question for you, Fiadi. Okay, so I, and I think I said I, I stayed alone. Um, I mean, I had just given a background. Um, I was still getting all the details of some of the things that I did. Yeah? So I was hoping that would come with uh, other questions that we had. But I didn't um, yeah. pay much. So is, is, let, me, let me just add uh, one, or one more question to that. So did, did, did mentoring help you in any way in your career growth? Were you very deliberate about mentoring or you just identified some people that you admired from afar and you learned you know, from them from afar or you, you had people that were 
Can you hear me? If you are the hello. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear yeah, me? So, yeah. I wanted to just expand on that question. That what role did mentoring play for you in your career progression? Okay. So yes, um, quite a quite a big one, quite a big one. But you know, even beyond one of the things that I did um, was trying to find. So I, I mentioned I had stepped into customer services and was just trying to find my way back. And it was tough. You know how in Nigeria they tell you you don't have the relevant experience, you don't have the relevant experience. So one of the things I did was I volunteered a lot to learn under a lot of people that had experience. I also read a lot. I started doing a lot of reading up, a lot of researching, just preparing myself for you know the opportunity that I wanted. And then I would always go for HR events, HR. Um, you know, when, once I see all of those HR events, I would go, career fairs, I would go. And, you know, I mean, it was pretty much very early in my career. And then I pretty much realized that maybe I admire some people who I met at those events. For some reason, I got closer to them, you know. So, but it was a mixture of things. It wasn't just mentoring. Yes, mentoring was a part. But I knew that I had to prepare myself for that time. So I did a lot of reading. One of the things that helped me was very early on in my career, I signed up to for SHRM membership. SHRM is, you know, the largest, uh, the largest, you know, like association you know, network of HR professionals around the world. So one of the things I did was I also signed up for the HR magazine, which I used to receive every. Every time I received that magazine, I would read it in and out, you know, page in, page out. I would read everything. And then I used to log on to the SHR website as a member. So I sent some member resources. I would read so much. I would learn, you know, how to use some templates and some forms. I would just learn more about strategy and how to do some things the right way. So I always, you know, say that I didn't learn my HR somehow the local way. I sort of learned by reading multiple articles on SHRM and it sort of prepared me you know, a best practice mindset sort of a best practice mindset sort of so yeah and then I remember I also you know always wanted to go into consultant and then I spoke to you know someone I had known you know about an opportunity to move into consulting in HR and you know just because and by the time I went in there I was able to also get to meet a lot of people who were senior who were more experienced, I learned under them. I would always reach out, call, ask questions, you know, just ask for support. I did, yeah. So one thing I always tell people, get a mentor, find yourself a mentor, but prepare for the job that you know, there's a place of preparation. So I remember the day I went for my interview, for the consulting interview. I mean, I didn't have, I wasn't like the best you know, when you talk about work experience, per se, I, had, I didn't have any consulting experience. I didn't have any, you know, like the kind of HR experience that one would want to see in, 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 in HR consulting. But the conversations we had at that interview made it clear to the interviewers that this is somebody who is passionate about this field and this is somebody who has been preparing for this field. And, I mean, I think that was the basis for everything. And then, you know, the hunger, the passion was very evident. And that was how, you know, I got that opportunity. And it's really helped me grow in so many ways. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have another question from, from Rata. Is did you later in the course of your HR practice or enjoy office politics? I didn't get that. Hmm? I, I have a question here, another question mm -hmm. from Razak. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Yes. I can hear you. yes, it reads, did you later in the course of your HR practice or enjoy office politics to excel in the organization you, you had worked for? I think the other question was, did, did, you... Did, you, did you, in the course of your HR practice or your HR career, did you practice or enjoy office politics to oh, excel in, yeah, in the organization that you have worked for? 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's one topic that if we if we talk about it today, we won't even leave this. We won't finish. Like <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, um, so the thing the way you say of this politics, uh, it's 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 quite broad. And what I one thing I will say is, I think every organization has office politics. But there is a place of emotional intelligence and a place of wisdom, you know, in navigating through the workforce. Because I say that because people are different. People are not going to, everybody's not going to have the same opinion. People are going to have different opinions. You are going to be an individual that has your own opinion. You have your own um, ideals, your own, um, what do you call it, values. And there will be certain things that will not appeal to you. But you will so at some point, you need to get your work done, cooperate with your colleagues, you know, not be seen as somebody who is you know, not doing what needs to be done or, what, you know, not, not lending your hands as a member of the team to move the work forward. So there's a place of wisdom, you know, know what to accept, know what to not accept, know what to get into, what not to get into. But office politics, did I play office politics? I don't think so. Maybe, but you know, that's what I'm saying that, you know, you, it's, for me, I don't want to call it office politics, but it's just knowing how to navigate the organization, how to work with people. You might have someone who is maybe bossy, erratic, or whatever. Just knowing how to, you know, work with your personality is the key thing. Yeah, it's not so it doesn't have to be, you know, like dirty and uh, you know those kind of things that people think about. No, but I am someone who, if I work in an organization or if I meet people, I just try to understand them thoroughly. I try to understand people are working thoroughly. So, you know, because, you know, people have different personalities, like I said. Um, you want to, you, you don't have to change your personality to please people or whatever, but you just need to know how your personality rubs off on their own and how you can control that in the work environment to achieve work success. Okay. Thanks, Ifiadi. So, you, you, had, you mentioned earlier that in the workforce we have different people with different opinions. And, and that was going to take me to my question around the different multi-generation month, generation that we have in the workforce today. I mean, research has shown that we have four uh, generations in the workforce, from the baby boomers to Gen Z, Gen X, and um, Gen Y, and millennials. You know, so my question is, given the fact that we have more personalities in the workforce, how can we as HR begin to integrate um, the acceptance of these varying personalities into our organizational structure? I mean, recently I was interviewing for a particular role and I realized that there was a particular generation that had already interviewed, the conversations were just different. I mean, in the responses were like, you guys, you know, you people, you know, even though it was a professional <laughs> interview, but it was obvious that, you know, their views were just entirely different <laughs> from what we normally uh, expect from, from, from candidates. And we see that playing out now in um, social media where people go for interviews and they experience um, different ways of being um, addressed or being spoken to or being spoken at in courts and the next thing it's all on social media. So as HR professionals, what, what advice would you give given the fact that we now have more Gen Z coming into the workplace and we are sort of used to, uh, we're sort of accustomed to have a particular way to um, manage people but now we have an entirely different workforce that they see things entirely different from how we see things so how do we manage how do we integrate that i mean you have policies that i'm not sure how often our policies consider the various generation into into the creation of those policies how do we manage how do we integrate how do we understand them to ensure that our organizational system fits into the very um, multi-generation we have in the workplace today? The first thing I'm going to say is, you know, having an open mind. That's, that's number one. 
you, you can't work in with maybe you can't work in a multi-generational workforce when you don't have an open mind. You can't you can't excel. So you're gonna have, you know, um, you're gonna have people like a revolution, just like we're having in Nigeria. There's it's obvious that there is a difference. There is a wide gap between the leadership and the people. So this is what you get. So there is you can if you want to, you know, excel in an organization where you want to lead people, you want to be the voice of the people, the voice of the management, you want to be the strategic person that goes between, you must have an open mind, which is you're open to new things, you're open to new ways, you're open to new ideas, new people, you're open to understanding that things will not always be the same way that you knew them to be, you're open to understanding that the world has changed, the work has, the work world has changed, you're open to understanding that the current workers are very opinionated. They have a voice. They, I mean, they would respect you because, you know, they have to respect you, but you get on their toes. They definitely know what to do to you. You talked about, you know, the whole thing about getting, you know, dragged on social media and everything. So these guys, are the, you know, they're, 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 there's a lot to do. So for you to work in a multi-generational workforce, the thing for me is, number one, you must have an open mindset. And another thing, three things I'm going to say is the three arrows, right? The three arrows, and that's one thing that, you know, you would learn in um, strategic plan management or global HR leadership is the principle of the three arrows, which is recognize, respect, and reconcile. Now, recognize that people are different. Recognize that you and I are not of the same generation and our thought processes are different. Recognize that um, what you know is not what I know or how you see the world is not how I see the world. Recognize that you are very comfortable wearing suits and ties five days a week and I'm comfortable sitting in my house to get work done maybe once or twice a week. That's flexible working, yeah? So recognize that. So it's important that there are generational differences. We must all recognize that. And then you must respect people's opinions and people's, um, you know, whatever it is that, you know, their desires, their thoughts, their opinions, we must be able to recognize their culture as well. We must be able to, you know, respect that. As much as we want to have a, of course, a, 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 a common culture for the organization and all whatnot, when you join an organization, you should align, but we must also respect the fact that people come from different backgrounds. Now, you work in a, in, in a multinational, for instance, I mean, in Nigeria, talk about, you know, um, LGBT rights, there is a 14 year sentence for, you know, that, but you work in a multinational where, you know, somebody who is in that, you know, category of individuals is being sent to the organization and you're here in Nigeria. So you must be able to recognize those things. They have their rights in whatever country they're coming from. They're coming here, you educate them, but you respect them. It's not your business, what their sexual orientation is, what their thought process. So we need to understand that. And then the third thing is that we Can we mute our mics if you're not talking? Now, what are we reconciling? We are reconciling the fact that we are all different, that we are different generations, that we all bring different things to the table, that we are, that, you know, diversity is important and beautiful, that wherever you come from, whoever you are, that your own thoughts, opinions, ideas are important. And the fact that we can all bring all our differences together to create one wholesome, you know, um, well, how do I put it? And we can all come together to build an organization that is built on, you know, specific yeah. ideas. To achieve, yes. to so achieve that's a common really, goal. To yeah. achieve a common goal, thank you. So that's, that's, that's it for me. So the objective, remember the three hours, recognize, respect, and reconcile. Wow. Wow. You know, Wow. Thank you. And I think, I think that is very powerful and, and, and spot on because really it starts with our mindset first. If we have our mindset open, would embrace, would, would respect, recognize first and foremost because we're aware that this, 
these are the peculiarities that comes with all the various generations that we have in the workforce now. And then we respect it. So, okay, this, this is you. We understand, we respect, and then we reconcile. So I, I think the reconciliation part is the most critical part where we're able to bring everyone on board. Uh, I, I see it as that's the inclusion part. So the, the, you recognize that diversity, then <clears throat> we're able to bring everyone together to ensure that we achieve a common goal. Fantastic. Okay, so I have one question here from Razak. As HR practitioners, um, how would you view, okay, as HR practitioner, okay, how would you view the recent protest championed by youths, NSAS and SWAT? Could this be seen as youthful exuberance from Gen Z, sorry, Gen X? and Jane, why? Oh, really? It's, it's X part of it. I would have thought it's uh, the Y and the Z. <laughs> what is the future of HR personnel <laughs> handling these generations of workforce in our various organization? So I think it's more of the, the Gen Z's and the Gen Y's, not X. Okay. Yeah. Did you get that question, Ifiadi? Okay. Um, yes, I did. How do I view the recent protests and how is HR going to be prepared to manage the Gen Z's in the workforce if they are thinking of this way, yeah? Absolutely. And do we think that the activity is right, so right? It was part of the question as well. Okay, yeah. Okay. So the thing for me is, uh, see, this conversation is, is a very broad conversation for me, and I don't know where to start, but I'm going to try to start somewhere. Now, let me start from the fact that our parents trained us in a certain way and conditioned us in a certain way. And our parents, from the way they also so trained us and conditioned us. They, you know, prepared us to see people who aren't the same way we were conditioned as um, as different, as you know, as different as to be discriminated against. Maybe that wasn't the purpose, but unfortunately, it has come to this. Now, you know, you go to a church and the the one about you know slashed jeans and dreadlocks and I don't know maybe long nails and chewing gum and stuff like that. and for those that are not a measure of morality or men who are maybe good and trying to um, yeah. The network is um, sporadic. I don't know if you can switch off your video. Maybe that might enhance the strength of your connectivity. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. No, I think it's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a lot better. It is better. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's a lot better. So, yes, so we were all conditioned to, oh, don't do this kind of stuff. Yeah, don't talk about challenge adults, don't call adults out when they're wrong, don't do this, be quiet, be this, be that. And so we, a lot of us were raised with that mindset. But you see, growing up and we are finding out that life doesn't necessarily have to be that way. So let me tell you that this revolution didn't start just with Nigeria. This revolution started with our parents. Now, you have parents of millennials and Gen Z's who are trying and adjusting, trying to just adapt to the new, um, to the new world that, the, the mille that started being created by the millennials and is now being taken to a different level by the, you know, the, the Gen Z's. So there is a lot of revolution and there is a lot of fire in the typical young Nigerian. And that's why you see that the young Nigerians have done so much, both in the corporate sector, music, entertainment, than the older generation. I mean, it's not like they have, they have, yes. But the younger generation has been taking 
the country in a different direction that we didn't think about before now. Yeah. So are people protesting? They are protesting for their rights. I totally support them. And I'm protesting too because um, as Lara mentioned earlier when we started this, I work in an industry that is endangered. I work in the tech industry. And I can't tell you how many times we have to think about how to make sure that people who work in our company don't get harassed, maybe because of the way they dress. If you walk into my organization, you would be wondering, you know, what kind of organization is this? You would find men in shorts or jeans and, you know, um, dreads and afro with their comb in their hair and all kinds of things, yeah? You would find people who just look different. They, I mean, they're not your typical Nigerian. So they are very easy to profile. They are very easy. I know like a developer in my office can for one week, two weeks, they, maybe they haven't combed their hair. And that's how one of them actually grew, grew his dreads. He was working on a project and he was working around the clock according to him because he was working on a personal project and a work project. He was working around the clock and he didn't, he said he didn't have time for grooming, that he would just jump into the shower, have a bath, come out, eat, that he would eat once a day. So he lost weight and then he, his head got tangled. He couldn't comb it out anymore. And he said, oh, well, looks like this really looks okay on me. And I'm just going to these people are a certain way. It doesn't mean we should profile them. And that's one thing I always tell HR people. Sometimes HR, you know, some other HR people talk to me about this. Like maybe they have been in other industries and then they move into the tech industry. As one of the things they see, you know, it comes to them as a shock. And then we go through that process where I try to educate them that, you see, this generation is not like the generations that a lot of us used to know. They are happy to walk in their own space, in their own way. They're happy to make their own rules. And trust me, even if they left the job today, they still have lots of opportunities. They have gigs, they have things, they have, it's because of the skills that they have. I talked about it earlier. We are in a skill economy and it's your skill that will push you forward. It's not even, oh, you have a full-time job where you sit down. Some of these guys are doing up to three, four, five gigs and they earn so much money on the, you know, every month. So I'm just saying, are they within their rights to protest? Yes. In the workplace, that's what I mentioned earlier. You need to understand that these people have a voice already. You don't even need. So, so let me give you a typical example. I, I handled a recruitment for a broadcasting company not too long ago. I think about two, three months ago. And one of the things that I tried to speak to the, to say to the HR people who, who picked interest in that room, like the short listed candidates, one of the things I told them while preparing them for that interview was, number one, it's a broadcasting you know, organization. They have a lot of talent, entertainers, broadcasters, radio presenters, TV personalities, on-air personalities. These people already have a brand and you don't want to mess with them. You don't want to go there and tell them, hey, HR, you have to want to, you have to try, there are subtle ways to build your way and also to build and gain trust. Because if you give them for a second the impression that they're in a fight with you, HR, and then that whole HR is evil kind of thing starts, and then there's a lockup, and then they're fighting against HR. So again, I, I say, HR, we must respect, we must understand, we must recognize, we must respect, and we must reconcile. The people, this young generation, they all have a voice. They have a voice. And if I also have a voice, and I keep saying it, like, I wish one day that Nigeria would be better. Like we, we, the way we operate as a country is not, look at, look at, I mean, look, look around other countries of the world. That's not how organizations, you know, how countries run. That's not how countries run. A lot of young people in Nigeria are smarter and way ahead of the government because they've taken technology as a leverage. And that's why, trust me, with all of these things, SARS is trying, uh, police and all the rest of them, how many true cyber criminals are there. I mean, I see that they're doing a lot of work, fine and good, fantastic. But there are many cyber criminals who are so sophisticated that our law enforcement cannot even think about that level of sophistication to crack down the things that they are doing, yeah? And then they would want to arrest some people or they see somebody on Instagram maybe, and then they say, oh, what does this person do? Arrest them, query them, but they don't even have the tools to investigate. But these you two are talking about are far ahead. They are far ahead. And then what happens? An illiterate man in uniform comes to interview them, talk to them, and 
the language is not you know relating and then somebody is shot somebody is killed somebody is tortured so that's why you're seeing a revolution because these people already know what they have and they want the government to at least try and adjust at least as minimum level as possible at least let us see that there is recognition for human rights and human life and would we want to see that happen in the workplace whether we want whether we like it or not it's going to happen people are going to demand for their rights and ask for certain things and you know want to work a certain way and, and it's already happening that's why people will tell you you come to an interview and you tell me so and you ask you do you have flexi working hours can i work from home blah 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 or can i can my contract be scared be flexible to accommodate so so so, so yeah so to a great extent we already see it in the workplace and as a hr person what do we have to do we just need to you know recognize that respect it and you know reconcile all the differences and move ahead from there wow thank you so much if you are i think that was really profound because we need to begin to understand that this uh that there's power in our talent it's no longer we no longer need to see talent as a need but talent is crucial for our organization given the fact that with the whole evolution now we need to begin to use fresh perspectives to understand them and of course respect them and then recognize and see how we can reconcile and bring everyone together awesome and i think for me it's it's a it's a call for us as the hr professionals as well how can we within our in, in within our individual circle of influence you know begin to give hope seemingly hope to our young ones the perception is there are no jobs out there but however how are we able to help them harness their talent beyond just looking for a job but how do we identify their strengths their talents ensure that you know they begin to bring out their ingenuity in in solving problems when a lot of young people reach out to me to say i'm looking for a job what i usually ask them is okay what do you have what you, what what's that skill or talent that you've got have you identified it you know using using the three r principle i'm just thinking through it do they recognize their talents you know their strengths and how, how do they even respect their opinion as well so i know i'm very good in in drawing but do i respect that or, or rather i'm looking out for um i'm looking out for a job as a sales officer or as an admin officer but it's respecting what i have and then reconciling it to see how can i use my talent to solve a problem I mean, the level of creativity and innovation that I've seen in the past one week in terms of how much uh, creativity has come out from this protest is just amazing. It is amazing. I, I see a lot of opportunity for us as HR professionals, as professionals, you know, as leaders. We are leaders within our own um, circle of influence. How are we leading these young ones in the right direction to be able to give them hope in themselves? even as they continue to protest and we lend our voice, we join them and we the belief that the government, you know, would yield to our call for a better Nigeria. If that has been an interesting one, it's one hour already. Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, the conversations are real. That it's less, it's us talking about what we, we believe is best for us as professionals and for our, our, our younger ones. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I apologize. I will not be able to take all the questions. I think I have one or two more questions left in the chat board box, but um, so we, we've exceeded our time already. If you had, it would like, be nice to get um, some passing word from you. I think the three hours that you shared is very profound and apt for the time that we are in. And I believe as HR professionals on this call, We'll go with the learnings on the principle of the three hours and see how can we help uh, talents within our organization, the various um, multi-generational talents that we have as we relate. And we bring back, we use it to bring back the human in the human resources. I mean, I read that on social media, bring back the human in the human resources. I'm like, okay. So we have a model that we can use to bring 
that to, to bear. Okay, so if it would be nice to get your passing word for, from us, from you to us. Thank you, Coach Lara. Ah, uh, sure, I see you. I see you and I see uh, your commentary on our parents' educational system. And uh, yeah, yeah, so this generation, yeah, work, they are work. Very, very work. Yeah, but we, we need to be able to yeah, so them. They are work. <laughs> they are work, yes. They are work. <laughs> yeah. So yes, um, part of what for me would be, first of all, um, please, let's, I, I support this. Mm -hmm. oh. And fast. Um, and fast. Um, like how many HR, people <laughs> HR people, you can attest to the number of your workforce that have relocated or left the country in search for greener postures, better living, and a better, just better lifestyle. So, yes, this concerns all of us. The same man has been in the same man who was in government in the year I was in diapers or in the year I was born, is the same man who is in government in 2020. We need to do something different for this country. So if you please join this, um, this okay. course, if you can go physically to if you can use Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, wherever your voice can be heard, even in your church, please um, let's make our voices heard. Let's make our voices heard. The time is now. And I mean, looking at what Shola wrote to us, and talking about, you know, how our parents, the kind of system our parents left to us. I don't want to leave that kind of system to our children. We want to leave a better system. Look at the Nigerian government. Like every time we're thinking of borrow this, borrow here, borrow there. But young, young people in Nigeria have found, founded a company that was just this week sold or acquired for $200 million. I don't know yeah. how many of us have heard about the Paystack story. Oh, yeah. Paystack yeah. has That's been acquired right. by Amazing. 200, yes. 200 just amazing. So look at look at the 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 you know the 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 paystack founders look at them yeah those are people who are very easy for the police to profile and shoot and kill now how many people whose stories would have been great have been wasted so those are the things so i encourage everyone i'm very much you know with this cause let's you know, do this hr people our voice can be heard my industry is endangered my talents are pretty much every day on the run from these people because they are carrying laptops, MacBooks, computer gadgets, and they're working on you know, systems and you know, um, technology products that they're being asked, oh, what is this? And um, you're hacking in the system or you're stealing something or doing something which is false because those people do not even understand what these people are doing. So let's all lend our voice to this protest, to this um, demand for a better Nigeria. For me, it is police reform, not only size. The entire police needs to be reformed and we need a better Nigeria. So that's it for me. So HR people, don't stay silent. You are the custodian of the law, the policies and organizations. Raise your voice, show that you care, show that you want to live a better country for your children. Let's not leave the kind of country that our parents left. And also join your voice and let us you know, speak against um, you know, profiling. You know, profiling wrongly people where the car they drive i have a cousin who is about to you know resume work outside of lagos and he wants to you know remove some things of his car just so let's lend our voice to this course um that's 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 the very very passionate and important thing for me right now yeah. but then again the important aspect is people we have to keep innovating keep staying true to the times keep having an open mind keep having an open mind um, Nigerian youths are lazy, Nigerian youths are stupid, Nigerian youths are foolish, Nigerian youths are this and that. We've heard all those things so many times, but trust me, Nigerian youths are the most creative youths anywhere in the world. Have you seen our payment industry, industry in Nigeria? Because we've been presented with you know, challenges and we've been you know, um, working with those challenges to build a nation. So yes, in HR, we have a duty, all of us, hands together, we have a duty, we keep innovating, we keep, you know, making our profession better, we keep speaking out, you know, for those practices that, you know, shouldn't be, and we keep advancing the profession. So those are last words for me, Lara. Thank you very much. Wow.
That was profound. Thank you so much, Ifiadi, for your time. I mean, you've, you've deposited seeds in our heart today from sharing your story, from sharing your view, from sharing your experiences. You have Sorosoke. And um, the Sorosoke today, and you've also encouraged every one of us to Sorosoke <laughs> as we continue to learn our voices, right? Co collectively yes. with our youth um, to ensure that the Nigeria we want, Nigeria of our dream comes to reality. Nobody's going to do that for us. We have to do it by ourselves. Thank you so much. On that note, I want to appreciate everyone that has taken our time from their weekend today to also learn and share with us. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm really grateful. I'm sorry, I can't read out all the names, but I see you. I see the names on the participant list. Thank you, everyone. On that note, I'd like everyone to off your mic, go off your mic, and let's all also, okay, let's appreciate this <laughs> Adi for her time, for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Fadi. God bless you. An amazing time. Thank you, Fadi. God bless you. This is Emperor. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's okay. So it's okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. It's okay. Love yes. your mic. Off your mic. Off your mic. Thank you. Because you need to recognize. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So the recording will be shared with everyone who registered. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sadie. Bye. I wish you an enjoyable, uh, enjoyable weekend. And I'm hoping that we can all go out and join the protesters. If we can, then we can do that on, online as well. So thank you. OK. Thanks, everyone. And please stay safe. Let's continue please. to have our go out, go on, so go anywhere. Yes, and let's lend our voice yes. with the protesters. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Better Nigeria. Yes, so we want a better Nigeria. Thank you, everyone. Bye.